I'm a, I'm a pretty nice guy. Just ask my parole officer. <laughs> Apparently, I'm not a funny guy. It's a question fans have been asking for decades. Did Phoebe settle by choosing Mike? Friends' Phoebe Buffay is quirky, unique, and has lived an interesting life. While by comparison, Mike Hannigan is kind of bland. You don't have to worry about glue sniffing with me. <laughs> Although I do smell the occasional magic marker. After seasons in which Phoebe's love life was sidelined, Mike was introduced seemingly so the writers could give Phoebe the happy ending the other characters got. In an interview in Variety, the actor who plays him, Paul Rudd, noted there wasn't much to the character, saying, I'm like a prop on this show. So you're a, a paleontologist, right? Yeah. My cousin's a paleontologist. Huh? Well, he and I would probably have a lot to talk about. But while subdued Mike may not be creative Phoebe's type on paper, ultimately he offers her stability and the kind of normal home-centered life she's long privately felt she wasn't allowed to have. Despite Settling's bad reputation, equated with denying yourself true happiness and sacrificing your deeper dreams in favor of stability, it's actually very common. A 2016 study in the UK found that only 23% of adults in relationships polled believed they were dating Mr. or Mrs. Wright, while the majority said they were with someone who was very definitely not the one. So rather than this being a tragic reality, could this be the secret to contentment? I think that you and I were destined to end up together. I think that we fell in love and, and we work hard at our relationship. Here's our take on Phoebe and Mike and how they redefine what settling really is. Maybe the key to a happy ever after. Thanks to Macarena for sponsoring this video. I don't always have hours to spare to play a long video game, and what I love about Macarena is that I don't need a big chunk of time. A round of this multiplayer combat game takes just a few minutes, so I can jump in and have fun with zero stress. I've been playing Macarena a lot lately, and one of my favorite mechs is Shadow. He's fast and stealthy, which makes him the perfect player for sneaking up on enemies. I'm also a big fan of Juggernaut, one of the toughest mechs in the game who is totally immovable. These two mechs have been really giving us the competitive edge, especially with the auto cannon equipped. Macarena just had the huge Mechs Are Here event where they raised $100,000 for charity. It started with the aftermath of a real-life Macarena battle on Santa Monica Pier in LA and finished with the Macarena Championship where the winners got to pilot a real-life mech. And that's not all. There's a ton coming to the game this month. On December 20th, there will be 12 completely unique pilots to choose from and customize. On top of that, there's Battle Pass Season 2, three new 2v2 deathmatch maps to fight on, and a packed schedule of holiday events. Did I mention that Macarena is completely free to play on Android and iOS? Just click the link in the description below or scan the QR code to get 50,000 credits, three gold craters, and one exclusive mech heraldic to help kickstart your game now. Find us in the game. We are ready for battle. Aside from ladies' man Joey, Phoebe is the only friend who doesn't really have a long-term relationship for most of the show's seasons. Just go from guy to guy, having fun, <laughs> and not worrying that it never turns into anything serious. And while Joey genuinely doesn't seem cut out for long-term commitment, it's less clear that Phoebe's actually fulfilled by staying independent and playing the field. When we look closer, her romantic history is beset with obstacles and exciting loves who disappointed her. She fell in love with her gay ice dancer friend Duncan, even marrying him so he could get a green card. But by the time he realized he wasn't gay, he was marrying someone else for real. If you had figured this out sooner and um, I had been around, do you think that I would have been the one who... No, no. That's right, don't tell me. She opens herself up to Gary, the police officer who wins her over with his sweetness, only to watch him shoot a bird on their first morning living together. And she has feelings for Ursula's fiancé, Eric, but it just gets too weird that he's been intimate with her twin sister. Well, if I didn't have sex with you, I had sex with somebody that looked an awful lot like... You had sex with Ursula? A, a little bit. <laughs> she, she, she walked in, I thought she was you, and I kissed her and... Standing out most is her one who got away, David, the scientist guy who moves away to Minsk. David's having left the country for a faraway destination ceases on one of Phoebe's core issues, the fear of abandonment. We know that all of Phoebe's family left her in some way. What am I gonna say? Like, hi, I'm Phoebe, the daughter you abandoned. So as much as David felt he had no choice, David ended up being another person Phoebe loved who ended up leaving her. Thus, it makes sense that one of the things she really values in Mike is how he stays by her even as things get difficult. 
Michael, a pimp spit in her mouth. I mean, if I can get past that, it shouldn't bother you. And later on, when Phoebe has to choose between Mike and a returned David, she goes with the guy who sticks around. Perhaps if I hadn't gone to Minsk, things would have worked out for us. Issues with abandonment can lead to people forming an insecure attachment style, but sometimes that can manifest in acting avoidant, being overly independent, and pushing others away so you can't get hurt. Phoebe is someone who's constantly giving to others. She even becomes an altruistic surrogate for her half-brother carrying his triplets. And this selflessness of Phoebe's, while genuine, could also be a way of proving that she doesn't need to be taken care of like everyone else. Given that she's acted for so long like she doesn't need what everyone else wants, it's revealing that Phoebe gets so unsettled by the idea that Mike doesn't see marriage in their future. While their relationship is developing nicely, Mike's refusal to consider marriage introduces an insecurity to their relationship which, for someone who's used to being let down by men, is difficult to come to terms with. It was, it was okay to move in when I didn't know what was going to happen, but I, I can't move in knowing nothing is ever going to happen. After they break up, and then he does eventually propose, she declines, underlining that it's not that she wanted to get married right away, she just needed to know it was a possibility. I just needed to know that we were headed somewhere, you know, that, that we had a future. The gesture reintroduces that security back into the relationship, and the fact that it was Mike who made the move to reignite the romance models something new for her, that while sometimes the people she loves may spend time apart from her, they can also come back. We can have any future you want. It just it feels like now it's my turn to have some of the regular stuff. There is a section of the Friends audience who argue that Mike is just too boring to be the right match for Phoebe. But after the chaotic early life Phoebe's lived, Mike gives her the chance to be, well, normal. Hey, I had no idea you were so conventional. I know, I guess I am. Phoebe's childhood was dysfunctional and difficult, including homelessness and lacking parental guidance. My real dad's the one that ran out on us before I was born. How have you never been on Oprah? And her journey in the show is about building the kind of functional, stable life she never had. In addition to her friends, she works hard at cementing connections with family, bonding with her half-brother Frank Jr., even though they're clearly very different people. How I told you about my likes and my dislikes, how, how I like to melt stuff and how I dislike stuff that doesn't melt. And embraces her role as the cool aunt to his kids. I can, I can babysit anytime you want. You name the day and I'll be there. Are you do that for us? Are you kidding? That's what sisters are for. She finds her birth mother and begins to see some of the similarities between them. So, you know, I wanted to tell you yesterday, but I just, uh, you know, I felt all floopy. And... and finally finds her father and is able to see some parts of herself in him, too. I mean, I made up a, a song to sing you to sleep. A sleepy girl, sleepy girl, <laughs> why won't you go to sleep? She even continues making periodic gestures towards her cold and aloof twin sister, Ursula. Happy 30th birthday, here. <laughs> it's for the child in you, and the woman. So after she's pieced together the family she always missed and started building a new extended family, she feels ready to have her own family. Mike also embodies stability to Phoebe because he comes from almost the opposite background from her, with a wealthy family and safety net. <laughs> oh my god, you're rich! No, oh, my yeah. parents are rich. Yeah, so they gotta die someday. Even as an adult, Phoebe occupies a more insecure, unstable position than some of her wealthier friends, getting by working as a masseuse and living in her grandmother's apartment. So Mike represents a certain class status and prestige that Phoebe may on some level find reassuring. Counterintuitively, settling can sometimes feel like a gamble. Like you're going all in on the here and now because you're betting nothing better will come along. But for Phoebe, her decision to choose Mike feels more motivated by the kind of future she sees for herself. But do I want that house in Connecticut, you know, near the good schools where Mike and I could send little Sophie and Mike Jr.? <laughs> Oh my god, I do. Mathematician Hannah Fry argues that in order to have the best chance of finding a stable partner, you should reject the first 37% of people who come along, and then choose the next person who's better than anyone that's come before. It's a tongue-in-cheek application of mathematics, calling to mind Zach Bornstein's viral tweet. The best way to tell if someone is your soulmate out of 8 billion people is if they are the third person you date in your mid to late 20s. But it does underline just how much our search for the one is shaped by timing. When Mike arrives on the scene, Phoebe is just beginning to consider her future more seriously and rethinking her past attitude toward relationships. 
I'm in my 30s and I've never been in a long-term relationship? Arguably, we see this in other characters, too. Monica is always under pressure from her parents to settle down, so she first gets together with Chandler at her brother's wedding. My mother's right. Never gonna get married. You know what, that is... Who wouldn't want you? After Chandler and Monica get together, Joey, too, begins weighing up whether he wants a serious relationship. I could get a girlfriend, yeah. We could sit in a chair and do crossword puzzles, but, you know, are we ever gonna have the, you know, the closeness like, like you guys have? So without Phoebe's quarter-life crisis around not having had a long-term relationship, would she have been looking to invest so much in Mike? Maybe not. But she loves him. They have chemistry. And the importance of timing in this picture underlines that settling is about making an informed choice about how what you have now can lead to a future you've always wanted. But I want to take care of you, have babies with you, and grow old with you. does settling have a bad reputation? Is it because we always assume that the grass is greener on the other side? Or is it because this more realistic attitude toward relationship building feels unromantic somehow? I'm not romantic, you know. I ask only a comfortable home. And considering Mr. Collins' character, I am convinced that my chance of happiness with him is as fair as most people can boast on entering the marriage state. Often what we've seen on screen has planted a deep fear of settling in many of us. In The Office, when we first meet Pam, she is a kind of cautionary tale of settling. She's unhappily engaged to Roy for years, not looking forward to anything, trapped in a settled stasis. The Dundee Award for Longest Engagement goes to Pam Beasley. <laughs> the discussion of settling often assumes that there's someone better waiting, and in Pam's case, obviously that's Jim. While Roy is brutish, cruel, and doesn't really seem to get Pam, Jim is kind, funny, and relates to who Pam really is. She's so great. The feeling that your better soulmate may still be out there is pervasive. In the UK study quoted previously, around 18% said they'd avoid marrying their partner in order to wait for the one. 33% thought destiny would intervene to introduce them to the one, and around 80% of respondents said they'd consider a future divorce if their soulmate showed up after they were married. Our culture believes settling diminishes something of yourself in order to fit the trajectory you think a relationship should follow. It's something Bojack Horseman creator Raphael Bob Waxberg expressed eloquently in his Twitter poem about Marge and Homer Simpson. Does Marge have friends? Who tells Marge to leave the brute, knowing she won't? You don't have to say. You deserve so much more. Countless stories tell us that choosing a lesser love may seem like an easier option, but it won't work. And it's just delaying an inevitable breakup. But settling isn't always choosing the lesser option. Instead, it can display a maturity that now you're thinking about the bigger picture of the relationship. In Knocked Up, Ben and Allison probably wouldn't have ordinarily ended up together. But when their one-night stand leads to an unexpected pregnancy, it forces them both to reconsider their priorities. You read the baby books? Yeah. <laughs> I did. I read three of them, actually. The family they create together becomes more important than each of them, and so they settle in order to provide a better life for their child. Don't tell mommy. It was the smartest thing I ever did listening to her, because now you're here. When Monica is weighing up her choice between Chandler and Richard, it's not just predicated on who she loves more, but who can give her what she wants out of a relationship. I'm not a kid anymore. I, I need to be with someone who wants the same things that I do. But she realizes that her and Chandler shaping their future together in the present is realer and more solid than Richard coming back into the picture and changing his mind after not wanting a family with her. This is exactly what Phoebe comes to realize when presented with almost the exact same choice in David and Michael. In the early days of her relationship with Mike, she backslides and kisses David. And during their marriage-related breakup, David returns and plans to propose. But despite Phoebe finally getting the chance to have that stability with the one that got away, now it's Mike that's really on her mind. I'm crazy about David and we're having so much fun together. Why, why do I miss Mike? Her eventual decision to choose Mike feels like a rejection not just of David, but the former ideas about love she had when she met him as a younger woman. Ideas that were more stereotypically romantic, but also more immature. Mike's characteristics are more important to the grown-up mature Phoebe than being with someone who's more dramatically weird or presents like a neurotic, exciting genius. 
Phoebe and Mike reveal that settling doesn't have to mean not choosing your soulmate, but rather that your deepest match and reflection of your values might not be what you used to think. These are my rat babies! <laughs> yeah, we have rat babies now. As different as Mike and Phoebe may seem, they're similar in ways that are important to them both. They're creative and appreciate the arts, bonding early on over their love of music and eclectic tastes. What kind of music do you play? Well, um, like acoustic folksy stuff, you know, but I'm, right now I'm working on a couple of Iron Maiden covers. They have a shared sense of humor. Maybe, most importantly of all, Phoebe doesn't have to diminish any of her quirks or eccentricities to make Mike happy, because it's exactly these eccentricities that Mike loves so much about her. So wonderfully weird. As a reflection of Phoebe, steady and calm Mike also reveals that underneath her wacky individualism, she too is surprisingly balanced and reasonable. Both are willing to listen to others, debate topics, and sometimes change their minds. This kind of open-minded resilience is an attractive and important quality, especially for couples who will need to evolve together over time. Returning to that UK settling study, according to respondents, the ideal soulmate was said to possess a forgiving nature, to be kind and caring, and to love me unconditionally. This sounds very much like how Mike is with Phoebe. I love Phoebe. And she's the single most important thing in my life. I'd die before I let anything happen to her. And of course, there's the fact that Mike is played by the very handsome and never aging Paul Rudd. Not a bad looking guy to settle with. So yes, Phoebe probably has settled with Mike, but in doing so she gives us a new, more optimistic interpretation of what settling actually is. Not accepting less, but instead knowing when to cash out because the going is good and it's time to enjoy your winnings. Now I'm standing here today knowing that I have everything I'm ever going to need. We are so excited to announce that we now have a line of Weird Girl merchandise. You can now express it through t-shirts, posters, mugs, a backpack. There's power in owning the Weird Girl in all of us. Announce that you are the Weird Girl. Click the link in the description below and get your hands on this one-of-a-kind Weird Girl merch.